you can start sharing your uh, yeah, presentation. Yeah, share the screen again. Now it's gone, of course. Okay, so let's try this one. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Okay, so it should be go full screen now. Yes, perfect. All right. So uh, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, you all and uh, especially the organizers uh, to uh, that that they uh, give me the opportunity to uh, present some of the work that have been, we have been doing for well, almost uh, twenty years, or actually uh, maybe it's even closer to twenty five. Uh, on uh, transition path sampling and uh, its applications to uh, complex uh, molecular processes. And I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, bio uh, uh, processes because that's the uh, theme of the workshop. Um, yeah, I prepared a uh, uh, actually a, a pretty long lecture, uh, but we'll see how far we get. Uh, so um, I introduced very briefly the uh, notion of rare events and why we need uh, something like uh, transition path sampling in the first place. Uh, I will show you uh, how we do it or how you can actually sample uh, uh, paths, how you can then uh, analyze them, how you can enhance the, well, the transition path sampling uh, for uh, reaction networks or for multiple state systems. And then I will hopefully show also some uh, advanced um, developments. And uh, only if I have time, I go to the uh, kinetic constraints uh, part, but I think I won't even get there, considering it's only 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, uh, again, I think um, this is a, a workshop where it's also uh, probably some pedagogical um, uh, part. So uh, if you have questions or if something is unclear, please uh, raise your hand and uh, well, maybe even interrupt me. Okay. Uh, let's go. So um, the first thing is uh, uh, that we are concerned with. Um, okay, I was, sorry. I mean, I have here a menu that I don't want to have. How does it work? Let's put it over here. Uh, the first thing is that we have uh, molecular dynamics uh, processes or molecular dynamics uh, in our uh, simulations, and uh, this is of course governed by uh, well Hamilton's equation or Newton equation, as you can see here. That's the Acceleration is the uh, um, governed by the gradient of the potential, and this potential is usually uh, um, uh, approximated by a um, a classical form uh, with bonded interactions and uh, non-bonded interactions, which are usually the uh, the, the, the Coulomb and and uh, Van der Waals uh, interactions. Um, and of course, the bonded interactions are uh, governed by bonds, the angles, and dihedrals. And here you see a nice uh, a movie of uh, such a um, molecular simulation as you probably have uh, done all of you um, previously. Now, the um, classical MD is capable of uh, um, uh, resolve uh, systems at atomistic levels. Yeah? And then uh, we can uh, do statistics and we obtain free energy landscapes. We can get uh, uh, stability of structures if, if the force field is all right, of course. But we even can get uh, transition states uh, between um, uh, two stable states. Uh, but further, uh, I think that classical uh, MD is also um, um, capable of uh, predicting kinetics, and that is. Uh, uh, important for um, observables like rates, but also understand uh, mechanistic uh, information of transitions uh, and even transport pro properties like uh, diffusive behavior. Now, classical MD has, of course, two important sources uh, of error. And I think that this has been discussed before. We have the uh, sampling problem. Yeah? That means that uh, we need to uh, cover enough of phase space to make a, a proper estimate of our uh, statistics. Uh, and uh, we have a systematic uh, force field error. And I'm going to focus on the first, the first part, the sampling problem in, in this uh, talk. Uh, um, one of the causes of the sampling problem is that the current MD uh, <clears throat> Uh, on all atom system is still limited to uh, uh, yeah, under the millisecond uh, time scales. Uh, um, I mean, I think that Anton still is the uh, record holder here. And most activated uh, events uh, can take much longer. Now, why is that? Uh, because uh, there are large um, barriers between states. And this is a picture that must be very familiar to you. 
So here we have a free energy landscape. This is the uh, collective variable Q or the order parameter as we sometimes call it. Uh, and here is then the free energy on the Y axis. And you see that uh, there is a stable state A and a stable state B, a transition state in between and uh, pathways or trajectories or systems that can linger in A for a while and undergo transitions to go to B. Now, when you see this in a time series, this will actually uh, usually look like this. So we have a long period that it stays in A, then it suddenly jumps to, to B and then it goes back again. And this is uh, known as a rare event uh, where the transition uh, goes um, quick in compare, compared to the molecular time scales uh, that are uh, over here. I mean, it, it's, it stays long in the stable state relatively. Okay, so um, now my, yeah. Okay, so if you have high dimensional system as we usually have in uh, biomolecular systems, a transition state search is actually uh, futile. It means that it's very difficult to find transition states. There's uh, too many of them. And what you usually uh, need is some sort of an enhanced sampling technique uh, that, uh, that is able to bring you from uh, A to B without waiting so long. And the way to do that is define a, a reasonably good reaction coordinate uh, using collective variables and then do some enhanced sampling. And I'm sure that, uh, that uh, you have all heard about uh, umbrella sampling. And of course, most famous in this community is also metadynamics. Now, this is actually sometimes troublesome. And this is actually uh, my attempt to, to, look, uh, to, to show why this is troublesome. So here we have a couple of uh, stable states in, a, in this case, a two-dimensional uh, free energy landscape. So here you see two stable states and one metastable state. But suppose that you only know about uh, uh, the X variable, yeah, then you would not even see at uh, this third state. And moreover, if you only know about Y, uh, the third state is also hidden. And what's even worse, it's outside of the uh, A and B um, uh, minima. So what happens if you actually um, move, uh, you start, for example, in this particular stable state, and then you move into this direction, uh, it's not guaranteed at all uh, that you uh, uh, escape um, into the right uh, well. But it could be even worse if you start in, in, in Y, uh, you go completely in the wrong direction and you, even, yeah, you will always stay in this same position. And this is very similar to the famous uh, cow uh, analogy. So here is uh, um, uh, a little cow and of course it's uh, uh, surrounded by flies. And the idea is if, if you then uh, use as a coordinate uh, the, number, the, the fly uh, position, you cannot expect that the cow is uh, following. This is of course uh, a little bit uh, unlikely. Yeah? So it is not the good reaction coordinate. I mean, uh, there is of course a, a little bit of a, uh, another way of looking at it. And that is uh, uh, in, in a more complicated uh, landscape like this, and where we have a, um, uh, again, a minimum here and a minimum there. And the uh, reaction coordinate um, uh, is uh, not only uh, along this Q, but also needs to go into the Q prime. And so uh, yeah, there is a settle point over here. But if you only push into the Q direction, uh, what happens if you, uh, the, the system doesn't relax uh, quickly enough into the Q prime, then it actually uh, shows huge amounts of hysteresis and you actually end up with the wrong estimate for the transition state. Now for this uh, type of systems, uh, it, it's clear um, that you need methods that, um, that circumvent this, this problem. And one way to do that is to use a so-called two-ended uh, method uh, where you create pathways, uh, trajectories between two priorly uh, defined states and that is uh, also in this case known as transition path sampling. So I'm going to focus on that and I'm going straight to what we actually do. Yeah, so the transition path sampling method is about an important sampling of the so-called rare event path ensemble. So it, uh, it yields the um, a path ensemble um, that can be analyzed uh, to uh, extract mechanisms reaction coordinates, kinetic rate constants, uh, and also uh, free energies. And so this is a 
nice cartoon showing how this is being done. And uh, just to remind you or, um, about um, the philosophy behind this is actually almost the opposite of what um, you would normally do. And so the TPS philosophy is that you start with uh, sampling all the path ensembles, so all the relevant trajectories, then go to the mechanisms uh, and to extract, and then from the mechanism uh, and uh, sampling more paths, uh, you get kinetics, uh, rate constants, and in the end, you actually end up with a free energy. And this is uh, uh, probably, or I mean, certainly uh, reversed from the normal way of uh, doing things. Uh, you first end up uh, in, in, in a normal enhanced sampling. You first do free energy calculations and then maybe uh, look at the kinetics later. Now, of course, uh, you want to have an exponential speed up. Uh, it means that the rare event time scale is uh, extremely uh, long if you um, if you have milliseconds or even seconds or even hours uh, to simulate uh, in real time this is of course undoable um, but uh, in in path sampling you focus on these very fast smart uh, fast paths and therefore um, uh, you get an exponential speed up this is only possible if there is of course a separation of time scales but in many cases this is the, the case we, the advantages with respect to other uh, pop methods is that you get uh, unbiased dynamics. Yeah? That means that all the um, trajectories are uh, real molecular dynamics trajectories. You get uh, exact rates and uh, the promise is that you get independence of uh, collective variables. Now, there's also software packages available and I want to point out open path sampling and pyretes here. Okay, so... Um, just to dive a little bit more into the uh, the details of the uh, of the method, uh, so uh, we actually first need to define a, a transition path probability density that we can sample. So to start with, we actually define the path itself. This is this bold x, which is of course uh, it has a parameter which is the length of the path, and it consists of a high dimensional vector of um, of uh, each of a uh, each of the frames and yeah, uh, the time frames uh, of the system. So this is the uh, system at time zero, uh, time uh, slice one, etc. So this is a discretization of the uh, space time. Yeah, so here you see uh, a two dimensional version of it with uh, the position R and the momenta P. And you can have a, 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 a time discretized um, uh, path like, like this. And then you can, uh, on that path, you can define a path probability by uh, defining a density or a path probability, sorry, a configuration of probability for the first time slice. And it's indicated by this circle here. So this is kind of a density um, of the first time slice. And then we have short time uh, um, Markovian probabilities, transition probabilities to go from the first slice to the next slice and then uh, along the path like this. Uh, so this is the initial distribution, so usually a Boltzmann distribution. And this is a short time Markovian propagator, which is usually uh, either an MD propagator or a, uh, for example, Langevin. And you can also do uh, Brownian or Monte Carlo dynamics. And uh, so this is indeed the path probability. Now, uh, the next step is to identify the stable states. And we usually do that by indicator functions. So we have here a uh, complex landscape again. Uh, so this is a high dimensional free energy landscape. And the idea is now to uh, identify within that landscape some stable states, and they should be fairly stable. So uh, low free energy or low energy. Uh, and you define this uh, as, um, uh, well, using an indicator function that says that the configuration is an A, uh, then this indicating function is one, and otherwise it's zero. And uh, then you can define this path probability distribution here. It's a restricted or a constrained distribution uh, where the uh, P of X is the same path probability here. And you put these two indicator function on the first and the last slice uh, or time frame, uh, And um, then of course also normalize, otherwise you don't get a distribution. So this Z here is a uh, normalization factor, which is similar to a partition function. 
Now, if you have a transition, uh, sorry, a, a path probability like this, you can uh, uh, propose a important sampling. You can construct a, um, uh, uh, a, a Monte Carlo of a, a metropolis. Um, no, what does I'm saying? A Markov chain uh, from uh, uh, by proposing a trial move and then accepting this trial move uh, with a metropolis hasting algorithm like this. And um, it turns out yeah, that you can write this uh, as follows. Yeah, so first of all, because of the for, uh, form of the indicator functions, uh, the, uh, the HA and the HB go out of the min function. So uh, you always need to obey the constraints, uh, but there is this, uh, uh, this complicated fraction to worry about, which is the path densities of the new and the old path, uh, and uh, also the generation probabilities of the old and the new path. Now, this sounds uh, almost like impossible, but the magic of uh, TPS is that, and now, yeah, uh, that this actually all um, becomes much more uh, simple if you use uh, a generation function which is actually uh, the same as the um, um, uh, the same as the underlying um, the underlying dynamics, and I have to I I, I see now that uh, I actually have changed this uh, by coincidence. So uh, so what we then do is actually we create a um, uh, a new path not by a, 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 a proposed move just in general, by just moving a, 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 a configuration around. No, we actually use a so-called shooting move. And the shooting move is a special uh, uh, move, which is okay if I have a initial pathway, like this uh, solid line here, and I identify a random slice on this, and this is a, uh, point here, I will take this by a random position, and then I move this slice uh, only a little bit with, uh, and in, in, in practice, we only change the momenta a little bit with a delta P, uh, and then I integrate my uh, equations of motions forward in time uh, uh, and also backward in time. And I do this uh, until I reach uh, well, the end of the pathway, or I reach the stable states, I'll come back to that later. Uh, and if this is a valid pathway, you can accept it. And if you, um, uh, if it's not valid, you reject it. Uh, so this becomes extremely simple. Now, why does it become extremely simple? Because the uh, generation pathway, as I uh, uh, told you before, uh, is the uh, probability to select a certain uh, frame uh, uh, x of t, uh, x of tau prime, and you actually change it a little bit. Uh, um, so this is the generation probability. And then you actually have a forward shot, which is, this, uh, is, is given by the propagator, but you also have a backward shot, uh, which is the reverse move. And what do you do in the reverse move? You actually uh, reverse all the momenta and you integrate backward in time. Uh, so yeah, it turns out yeah, that the uh, backward integrator is the same as in the deed, the uh, momentum reversal and then integrate forward in time. Now, if you uh, assume a symmetric generation prob uh, probability, so uh, this part is symmetric, yeah, you, the only thing you end up with if you fill in all these uh, generation probabilities is these uh, large uh, fractions here with all the generation probabilities and the acceptance probabilities and the path probabilities, then uh, you assume, not assume, you know that the system obeys microscopic reversibility. This means that if you go from a position X to a position Y um, uh, and you divide, uh, this is the transition probability for this particular transition, and you divide by the reverse uh, process, then this must be equal to the uh, ratio of the uh, Boltzmann distributions. Yeah, so this is a, a property of the phase space. 
And this, uh, if you plug in uh, this in here, everything cancels. This is of course the, the lucky part of the, uh, of the, of the, why the TPS works. And so you only end up with this particular uh, acceptance ratio, uh, which even for constant uh, energy at the shooting points uh, reduces to this very simple uh, um, uh, expression. Now, this is a, a long story. Um, so what you actually do in a standard TPS algorithm is to choose a random slice. You change the momenta slightly. So, and you actually integrate forward and backward. So you get a, uh, a trial path. Now this trial path is obviously not correct because it goes back to the initial state. So this is a rejected. This one is accepted, so it replaces. Then you do this again and again, and then you calculate uh, average of all these path ensembles and you repeat this uh, indefinitely. Now, of course, uh, um, the, uh, th this is a, the standard shooting algorithm. This is uh, only valid for when you don't change the, uh, the energy of the Hamiltonian uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the slice that you chose. Um, if you, uh, but you want to change it anyway, of course, you want to change the, uh, uh, the delta P to get a new path. And this is, uh, and it works of course, because uh, you do change your paths a little bit. And because uh, at the barrier paths actually uh, um, are uh, more likely to go to the, uh, to the stable states uh, than in one of the, uh, the if you start in one of the stable states. Uh, so you uh, select paths of shooting points which are close to the transition state. Now you can actually do uh, a, a lot of different uh, uh, sampling algorithms. Uh, and one of the uh, most uh, promising or the most important for biomolecular systems is to do the so-called one-way shooting algorithm. And that is uh, if you start with a, um, a path like this, this is the, the black path, you select a, par, uh, a new frame and now you only shoot one way either forward or backward. And the reason why you would do that is that um, uh, in, in this particular form, when you have deterministic dynamics, you have a fair chance of uh, um, being close to the old path and you have a high acceptance ratio. Now for a um, diffusive path or more um, a path where um, the, yeah, the, the, the friction is much higher, this is not necessarily the case and you end up with a, a very low acceptance ratio. And for that, you actually say, uh, instead of two-way shooting, you do one-way shooting. So that means that you, uh, you only go forward. And then in the next iteration, uh, you, you go uh, probably backward and you end up with a completely new path. Now, this of course only works uh, if you have enough sampling. So you need to do some sort of a, a check and this check is often done by uh, decorrelation pathways or decorrelation trees. Yeah? Um, so you start up, up, up here and you do all this uh, shootings yeah? and you see the number of MC steps or the, the shooting uh, steps uh, here uh, indicated in a forward, which is red and in a backward, which is green. And then you can see how this actually evolves uh, over, over uh, time. And in the end, uh, you, uh, you have sampled uh, completely different pathways. Uh, this is called uh, decorrelation of paths. And we have to be a bit careful because uh, the word decorrelation is, is a little bit over um, used here. What, uh, uh, what this means is actually that it has no frames in common uh, with the previous path if it decorrelates. Now, um, this is only one example of a, a shooting algorithm. And in fact, we have now many shooting uh, algorithms. So here is a very recent paper that overviews all of the different uh, approaches. I'm not going to uh, uh, go too much into detail, but I do see a, a hand raised by someone. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Hi, um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was wondering what is on the x-axis of the decorrelation pathway, and I, I never saw that graph, so um, I'm interested. This one, yeah, it's a complicated graph. Um, good question. Again, on the y-axis is the time mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, but this is not only Monte Carlo time, and on the x-axis is the simulation time. 
So uh, here is the initial path, or, or like I, I should actually start here. This is the initial path time zero. Mm -hmm. This is the initial path time T or the, or the last time slice. And when you move to the next pathway, you have uh, a different path. It could be longer. Mm -hmm. This is of course uh, an interpretation of the um, this particular uh, shooting move where we can have a flexible uh, length. And the reason why we do flexible length is that this is much more efficient than uh, uh, always go to the end of the trajectories. Okay. Is that, is that a bit clear? Because it is, it is a whole... Um, it indicates how long you need to reach one of the stable states then... The, yes, exactly. Yeah, the longer it is, the longer it, uh, it, you have to wait for that you, before you enter your stable states. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This is, I mean, in the original versions, uh, the, the length of the path is always fixed, uh, but we found out over the years that a flexible approach, uh, flexible path length is extremely much uh, more efficient uh, and because uh, you don't have to simulate all the time that you actually end up in this, uh, in this um, region. Okay, I think I'm going... Uh, further now, are there more questions? No? Okay. Um, yeah, my, for some reason, it doesn't want to go to the next slide. Yeah. All right. One important thing is how do we define states? Uh, here is an, uh, uh, a slide that explains uh, uh, what you should do. Well, if you use, if you do have these two basins or two uh, stable states and you use one so this is uh, the X and the Y here are different uh, order parameters or CVs. Uh, if you use uh, two different parts of two different CVs for a definition of both, uh, this will actually lead to trouble. Uh, so that means that if you're here, uh, you're actually in, uh, in this, this dark yellow, and uh, you're actually both in A and in B. So this is not, not good, obviously. The same holds for, uh, and so there's a big cross here. Uh, so this is, is a similar situation that you don't want. Uh, if you are um, defining your yellow block uh, as uh, state A, uh, but actually there is some overlap with the basin of B, this is asking for trouble. So this is also not good. Um, here is a similar situation. It's very similar to this, but here you actually, uh, you think you already reached B, uh, but you did not, and you actually go back to, to A. So this is also not what you want. So what you should want is the last version, uh, the last, uh, and you want to uh, make sure that things are in A uh, or in B, but there should be no overlap between the, um, uh, between basin A and the stable state definition of, uh, sorry, basin B and the stable state definition of A and vice versa. And so this means uh, uh, that you have to be careful with the, defining the state. And the rule of thumb is always that you want to be as strict as possible, and meaning that you should um, uh, be certain that if you are entering the state, the stable state, and you also stay there. Uh, this is actually uh, uh, the rule of thumb that you need to uh, uh, obey. Okay, so uh, this was a long introduction. Uh, I'm sorry for the, uh, the, the length of it, probably. Uh, so there are some, uh, yeah, over the years, there have been many applications. So here's a short overview. And so there has been uh, applications to chemical reactions and solutions, uh, to glass transitions, uh, to microphase separations, enzymatic reactions, um, reactions in uh, lipid membranes, um, nucleation problems, uh, and also by molecular conformational, uh, conformational change. And uh, of course, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, 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 these um, applications. And um, uh, I'm going to show you along the example, and this is a famous example of the photoactive yellow protein, uh, how we actually uh, conduct these type of uh, tra uh, transition path samplings and how we think about uh, how to extract information from it. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of background. This is a, uh, a small protein, uh, the photoactive yellow protein. Um, uh, uh, it comes from uh, 
cyanobacteria. Um, uh, and it is a signal uh, protein that actually um, warns the uh, bacteria for um, a harmful UV light, and it gives you a, a signal, and then it actually, uh, the, the bacteria can respond by swimming uh, away. And uh, the question is, how does it do that? Uh, well, it actually um, has a chromophore, which is a p-chromeric acid, which is actually pointed out over here in this yellow box. And this is, of course, uh, capable of uh, absorbing uh, light. And uh, this is embedded in a uh, hydrogen bonded uh, uh, pocket or a hydrogen bond pocket, uh, it's a binding pocket, I should say, where we have the chromophore in yellow here. And it's uh, um, uh, held in place by this uh, glutamic acid uh, 46, this uh, trianine, this tyrosine, and this, um, this cysteine is actually the, how it is covalent bound to the backbone. Okay, so that's the, uh, um, uh, the, the workings of the, of, the, of the protein. And then there is a, um, a, a photocycle, which actually uh, has a ground state, which is, uh, is yellow, that's why it's called a yellow protein. And what you can have is then you absorb a blue photon and the whole thing uh, shifts to the red, and it's called PR. And uh, what happens then is that uh, you get a cis-trans uh, isomerization, or it goes from trans to cis, I would say. And because of that, um, a, a proton transfer follows uh, and you get partial unfolding into a signaling state called uh, PV, which is blue shifted. And then uh, um, we get a signal transduction and a ground state recovery. And what we tried to find out is how uh, is this mechanism for amplifying the signal actually happens? Uh, how does it occur? And we studied here two steps. One was the proton transfer and the other one was the partial unfolding. And to do uh, the proton transfer first, uh, we uh, did some QMMM simulations. This is, uh, I mean, maybe a bit basic. Uh, it's very old work also uh, using uh, CPMD and uh, in the QMMM version with a, a blip functional and an old uh, grow mass force field. Uh, but what you can see here is uh, that uh, you can clearly see the, uh, the proton uh, being transferred. And I, maybe I should show it again. So at the beginning, um, so this is the cucumeric acid again uh, with the cysteine here in yellow. The tyrosine is uh, hydrogen bonded to the, to the chromophore. And what you can see is that there will be a proton transfer over here. So there you go. Let me see, there it comes. Yep, there it went. And you see it, uh, the donor was the uh, glutamic acid. So this is actually how, the, uh, how we can uh, identify the, um, the transition mechanism. And uh, it is actually using very short paths, but you should imagine that this uh, reaction time is on the microsecond level. Yeah, so we have a, a, a separation of time scales of about a million, which makes, uh, well, it makes complete sense, but it also shows you that you can speed up this mechanistic uh, calculation quite a bit. Well, we didn't linger too much of this part, just showing that we can do a proton transfer. Uh, in, in this work, uh, we actually looked at uh, partial unfolding. The title went off. And so here you have, you start with this particular uh, proton transferred state. So here the, uh, the proton is already on the, uh, on the uh, on the p-chromeric acid, on the gromophore. And then you have a couple of uh, intermediate states, uh, which are dubbed uh, I alpha and U alpha. And then there is a, a fork in the mechanism uh, where the, uh, um, the glutamic acid moves to the solvent, and then uh, you get partial unfolding of the, um, yeah, of the, uh, uh, the binding pockets. Now we can actually do a transition path sampling of all these intermediate steps. And so here you see some statistics. So each of these steps here uh, needed a special uh, path ensemble. Uh, we actually have uh, paths that are on the order of nanoseconds, 100 picoseconds to nanoseconds. And then you can do in this study a few hundred of them, maybe not enough, but we do get decorrelated paths. And for this, uh, so this was already an old, old study of, uh, uh, I think, 10 years ago now, uh, uh, where we actually uh, already did a couple of microseconds of uh, MD, and then that time that was quite a bit. 
Okay, so here is again the, uh, the movie. So what you can see here is um, uh, uh, the proton transfer and then the solvation of the uh, peak of, of the glutamic acid. And then at the end, uh, you see the solvation of the, uh, the chromophore. So this is actually uh, uh, these, uh, these couple of steps that you can, um, you can uh, visualize in this uh, particular way. Now, the question is now, uh, what type of, um, uh, if you have this information, what can you do with it? And how do you extract uh, information on the reaction coordinate? And to do that, we actually um, devised a, um, well, a method that actually use, makes use of the so-called committer. And the committer is a, 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 a high dimensional function. Uh, it's, it's, it's a probability as a function of a certain uh, uh, configurational state it can also be a phase space uh, point, but in here it's defined as a configurational uh, point. So this configuration is called X. And if you initiate a trajectory with randomized velocity, uh, it has a certain uh, probability that to end in B um, versus ending in A. And this probability is called uh, the, com uh, the commitment probability or the committer. Now, if this probability is a half, that means that it is equal likely to go to B as it is go to A, you can call this a transition state. In fact, it's a, a the operational uh, state, uh, the operational definition of a transition state. Um, and in this way, if you do that for uh, all the pathways that you, um, uh, the pathways that you collect and you actually screen these pathways for points where the committer is a half, and this could be over here, you get the so-called dividing surface. And this dividing surface is a uh, proxy for the, or actually it is the transition state ensemble. Uh, it's a transition state ensemble. Uh, it's it's uh, TSE, transition state ensemble, which is the intersection of the transition pathway with the committer half surface. Now this is very useful because this uh, committer half surface it's actually the embodiment of the reaction coordinate. It's the embodiment of what um, uh, distinguishes the uh, reactive from the product state and how do you actually go from one uh, to the other. So um, one thing that, uh, I mean, there has been many attempts to actually do uh, reaction coordinate analysis based on this. I'm not uh, going to talk uh, about uh, most of them, but I would like to point out the, um, the one that we mostly use. That's the one uh, that was uh, developed by uh, Baron Peters and uh, Bernard Trout uh, a while back already. And um, it, it, the idea is that we know that the committer is the reaction coordinate. It's the optimal reaction coordinate. The problem is only that this is a very high dimensional function and it's very difficult to, uh, to gain insight. And so usually we need some sort of a dimensionality reduction. Uh, and in this re uh, reduction, you find the, the best low dimensional order parameter combination that best uh, represents this committer. Now, the way you do this is by interpreting each uh, TPS uh, uh, shooting attempt as a, uh, as, a, as a part of a committer calculation. So, yeah, so each, um, uh, so suppose that you have done all the transition path sampling, but you know precisely what each of the shooting points wa was and where it ended. And each of these is a, uh, a, a committer attempt. Now, what you can do then is you use this information to optimize a reaction coordinate model, uh, which is here denoted uh, R for reaction coordinate as a function of uh, a number of uh, collective variables Q then you can actually uh, write down a likelihood maximization or a likelihood model, uh, which is actually the, the committer um, uh, function as a function of this uh, model R, which is then based on the um, uh, collective variable Q, which in turn is based on the exact uh, coordinates of uh, the shooting points. Uh, for the B, the, the ones that go to B, uh, versus the ones that go to A. And what you can, you can visualize this as follows. So for example, the red points here, they go to uh, B, 
and the green points that go to A. And you can clearly see that there is a separation. And so the best or, uh, vector that, uh, or the best um, uh, yeah, the variable that represents this uh, is this uh, high dimensional vector uh, that is indicated here. And that can actually reproduce the, um, the data in the most, or the best way. So you can do that for um, the helix free unfolding. So this is the first step in the, uh, in the unfolding of the uh, uh, PYP, uh, where we actually uh, took uh, 78 order parameters and we um, found out uh, that these uh, three, four actually, were the most important. And so this is actually uh, the, the RMSD of the alpha, which is just a, a proxy for how good the alpha helix is. Um, the uh, number of waters around the tyrosine, the distance between the alanine and the proline, and uh, another distance uh, of a hydrogen bond involved in the, in the helix. And they are indicated here uh, as well. And then you can, of course, do likelihood maximization and find out, in this case, uh, that this combination was the, uh, the most uh, uh, well, uh, the, the, the description that is best describing the transition. And you can then further test that uh, using uh, committer analysis. I'm, uh, so we can do the same for the, the solvent exposure transitions. Um, so here is uh, the um, exposure of the, uh, of the uh, glutamic acid into the solvent. Uh, so he, that's the first step. Uh, but uh, I mean, as I said, there was a, a, a fork uh, in, the, in the mechanism. It could also be that the Roma fork goes out first, but this turned to be, uh, out to be a rather unproductive in the sense that the next step would be very high. Um, and so uh, most of the flux goes through this path uh, into the final uh, PD state. So we can actually also do some uh, coordinate analysis and here find uh, that for the first uh, transition, uh, it is mainly determined by the, the distance between the chromophore and the glutamic acid, whereas in the, um, uh, in, the, in the other state, there is a more complicated uh, any other transition as a more complicated reaction coordinate. But this actually shows you that you can uh, analyze these uh, fairly complicated uh, transitions uh, using um, the uh, path analysis, uh, the uh, committer analysis of the path ensemble. Um, it's important to understand that this is a, uh, here the rate limiting step is about uh, a, a mil, a 16 kT, and this is about a, a millisecond. Okay, here is a, a nice visualization of what we actually uh, figure out is the entire uh, transition um, uh, path ensemble. Okay, I'm, uh, I see that I already, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, I'm talking for a long time. It's, it's pretty hard actually from, uh, from this part of the, the screen. Um, I, am, um, I am thinking of what I should do now because uh, there's quite a bit of material to cover. Um, and I am thinking I'm going a little bit, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, maybe, sorry, Peter, maybe let's say 10 minutes more, things like that. Sorry? Uh, ten, like 10 minutes more. Also, Peter, maybe you can take a, sh a break. Oh, you can go we can for take a break, break yeah. something. It's not, uh, well, this is what I would, Otherwise, talking in a row for two hours is a very long thing, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so maybe we should have a short break and have some questions, uh, maybe already. For yeah, maybe it's a good idea. Yes, I mm -hmm. think that's a good idea because I then also uh, yeah, we can skip a few things. Then uh, maybe okay. So um, go ahead. I mean, uh, are there any questions up to now? Hello, hi. I was wondering about the state of automation. So all this, can you hear me? Yeah, very, uh, very soft. But very low, mm -hmm. all right. How about now? Yes, yeah, slightly better, yes. Yeah, it's better now. All right, great. 
I was wondering about the, the state of automation of all these steps uh, since uh, that last paper you showed us from 2010. I saw there's a cons apparently there's a consortium of open path sampling. And yeah. so are tools being developed to automate these processes as much? Yeah, as very good, very good point. Uh, indeed. Um, yeah, so this was actually a, an old uh, paper. Of course, I have, uh, uh, there's a newer work as well, but what you want um, is indeed a software um, uh, code or package uh, that can deal with that. And that is indeed done by the open path sampling um, uh, code. And I, now I have to share this again. How do I do that? Okay, I'm sharing, but it's not working. Yeah, so can you see this or no? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, so this is actually uh, a, a, a slide which actually shows you how uh, what what the open path sampling uh, aims to do. Uh, so we have um, uh, um, a Python library for these um, the, the sampling itself, and at the moment it works with uh, Chromex and OpenMM. Uh, we have also LAMP support, and it's. Uh, basically using the uh, at this moment also the um, uh, MD trash type of uh, functionality for analyze, uh, analyzing uh, trajectories uh, but it can uh, allows you to um, uh, yeah define stable state trajectory ensembles and do all uh, kinds of uh, networks even so I didn't talk about it yet uh, but it can also calculate rate constants uh, and do um, analysis uh, like, uh, like path densities and, uh, and uh, analyze also the, um, the reaction mechanism. Okay, so that's actually the uh, open path sampling. Uh, right. How uh, about binding? Can, can you apply this to small ligand binding? Um, yes, sure. I mean, depending on how you, uh, uh, yeah, no, of course you can. The, I mean, what you always have to take into account is that you need to be able to uh, create um, stable states and have, um, and you should be sure uh, that there is a, um, uh, yeah, there are, th that the pathways between the two states uh, do not have, um, I'm not becoming indefinitely long. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's, I think we can talk about this more in uh, in in a in a different way. Um, I am also not so sure what I should do next. Wait a minute. Uh, so uh, can uh, the the chair help me a little bit here? What what is now the plan? Uh, Maybe you can continue answering the question. Otherwise, there are like maybe ten minutes more talk. I'll yeah. Say, because then we stop uh, for a break uh, at eleven thirty, and then uh, let's say it's over. I mean, at around eleven thirty, yeah. then there are okay. other speakers. All right. Um, Sorry, yeah, that, but that, I mean, that, uh, talking yeah. about the ligand, the ligand binding. I'm, uh, so I don't have an example uh, of ligand binding, but I, I you, you, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you can do this. So we have looked at uh, protein dissociation, which is not really ligand binding, but there we can actually uh, uh, sample uh, pathways. So maybe show this for a second. Um, God, this is really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's um, really struggling, guys. Okay, so here is the um, uh, a uh, an application of, uh, of, of protein dissociation, which I find, uh, okay, so, so here you can actually see a nice uh, uh, transition of the, um, or how the dissociation uh, works. And this is, uh, you can do this with, uh, with TPS. 
and, and you can already see that it lingers on uh, for quite a while in a kind of the metastable system before it actually uh, uh, really dissociates. Uh, so you can actually uh, do hundreds of trajectories here because these are, uh, I mean, these are very diffusive trajectories as you might imagine. And we can analyze this and then uh, you can see that uh, these, um, the dissociation uh, occurs via uh, uh, different uh, mechanism and we dub them um, uh, aligning, uh, hopping and sliding tra tra trajectories uh, which actually indicate different ways of uh, um, that the, uh, well, that the two proteins actually um, connect to each other and so uh, how you actually um, you can understand the nature of this mechanism and identify transition states exactly in the same way as I already pointed out uh, by uh, an anal analyzing these uh, these reaction coordinates and then you can really find out what the important uh, coordinates are and in this case it, uh, it for the sliding paths for example it turns out a, a crucial uh, salt bridge uh, that is um, involved in the in, in, in the mechanism. So uh, yeah, so I mean, of course, identifying such a coordinate is is uh, is probably not enough. Eh? You also want to really look at how these transition states look like, and you can actually identify and really uh, in some of these transition states this uh, this. Um, this 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 all which really plays a, a, an important role, and in others uh, uh, you actually can show uh, that there are um, uh, bridging waters, and these bridging waters actually make the pro the protein more mobile, so it can actually uh, slide uh, easily uh, over, um, and it can roll over the surface of a, of another protein. Okay. Um, two oh, questions. Sorry, it's a last yeah, so I'm, now, I'm actually now a little bit confused, guys, because um, the problem is now: should I actually uh, take some more questions, or actually, there is one more question here okay. in the yeah. chat. Maybe I don't know. I can read it for you, or you can read it yourself. And do do you have? Do you see it? Otherwise, I can read it. Yeah, I can. Yeah, maybe, maybe you have to uh, be a bit more careful. Uh, in the last lectures, we learned some ways to accelerate the simulation process. I was wondering if there would be a way to do so in here by reducing the number of unsuccessful transition attempts. Um, and maybe you can, exp the one that uh, asked this question can explain this question a little bit. Are you talking about um, the number of uh, 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 rejections in the uh, uh, path sampling steps? Okay. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so, you must realize that the way that uh, path sampling, in this case, the transition path sampling works is uh, because it is a Monte Carlo algorithm. Uh, so creating a Markov chain uh, in uh, path space. Um, so it means that um, for any Monte Carlo um, method, you need some rejections because if you, would make changes to the systems which are too small. Uh, you can have 100% acceptance, but uh, you don't get anywhere. Uh, so this is the eternal dilemma between exploration and exploitation or uh, something uh, where you make big steps, but you don't, uh, you're, you're never accepted, or you make two small steps and you will always be accepted, but you don't get anywhere. So there's a fine line, a Goldilocks zone, where you uh, are just right, where you have a, a sufficient uh, a, uh, acceptance and sufficient exploration. And uh, the way 
to think about this is that your acceptance should be usually around 40%, something like that, 40 to 50%. Um, usually we get a little bit lower than that because it's, uh, it, it turns out that it's, um, yeah, I mean, depending on uh, the type of shooting algorithm, you can, uh, uh, and, and, and especially for the diffusive pathways that we have over here, okay, you cannot expect um, uh, much higher than 50%, uh, basically. So yeah, and the answer to your question is, uh, if you have a way to reduce the number of unsuccessful uh, tra transition attempts, uh, that would be uh, great. But because we're uh, using um, uh, this shooting algorithm, uh, we are already um, uh, pretty high up in the, uh, in the acceptance. Now, I, I should actually say that it's not completely uh, correct what I'm saying, because we have, we assume now already a, um, an unbiased, um, uh, randomized shooting point selection criterion where we have, uh, you, you choose shooting points from the entire pathway all over the, uh, the place. And this is, of course, uh, can be very detrimental. Uh, if your pathway is uh, long and uh, there will be a substantial part is inside the stable states, then clearly your acceptance will be lower. So one of the uh, important parts is that you choose the right algorithm. And one of uh, that's why I actually said in the beginning, there are many shooting algorithms uh, and yeah, a good algorithm is, is important. So one of the ones that we now usually use is, uh, is this so-called spring shooting and I, I skipped all of, all of that because it turns out that if you have uh, a diffusive process and you use uh, un uniform one-way shooting, this actually has an extremely bad decorrelation. Um, the reason is that if you have a, a system like this, where you have a barrier, uh, a very strong uh, stable state, and then a large plateau, uh, before you actually reach the, the final state, then all the trajectories that start over here in this regime give you pathways uh, like this in the tree, which, uh, which really don't help. They really don't show any decorrelation. So what you really want is only focus your shooting around here on this part of the... Uh, so how do you do that? Well, one way is to actually uh, devise uh, new um, methods. And this one new method is called, in this case, spring methods, uh, where you, uh, uh, you propose uh, new shooting pool points based on the old shooting point and by shifting it a little bit. This is akin to what uh, the aimless shooting is about, but this is uh, probably leading too far. Okay. Um, uh, to be honest, I wanted to say a lot more, but I found it extremely difficult to, uh, to I mean, this is almost like, uh, I mean, normally if I, uh, if I do some, uh, some pedagogical lecture, it is usually based on existing courses. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to find out what I should say now. Uh, I think it's important now to actually show a little bit further uh, what we actually can do. And that uh, is to actually go to uh, rate constant calculations. Um, uh, if I may, um, Angelo, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's see. Okay, so, all right. So of course we have now this discussed how you can actually calculate half ensembles uh, and how you analyze this, but we haven't gotten to the uh, transition uh, uh, rate constant yet. Um, and to actually say a little bit more about that is uh, we, um, uh, many years ago, we also looked into to that and actually it's also part of the first uh, transition path sampling papers. Uh, but I want to uh, show you um, slightly different approach, which is the transition interface sampling. 
Um, this is actually based on the notion that you can create a very long trajectory, a very long MD trajectory, and uh, you can um, identify the history of the state that you lost. I'm sorry, you're not sharing the screen. Is it not? Or just... Am I sharing the screen? Not right now. I think not at all. Let's see. All right, okay. So I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry about all of this. It's, it's very. Okay, so can you see something now? Okay. I... Yes, now we can. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um... Okay, so um, so here is a a picture of a, a very long trajectory, and uh, I colored it according to where the trajectory was lost, uh, in what state it was lost, and so if you do this, then um, uh, uh, this is the the perfect way to create um, or to count transitions, and you don't. I have the problem of uh, recrossings. And so all these excursions uh, that are uh, uh, outside of B, and uh, they are clearly not uh, recrossings, and then, then go back to, uh, only if you really go to A, then you are sure that you are uh, committed to A again, and then you have uh, crossed the rare event. So if you actually do this, you are sure that the rate that you calculate is exact. Uh, this is called the over, um, uh, yeah, it, 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 it goes under several names. Uh, in the original paper, we called this the overall state uh, definitions, but it's also uh, in, in the literature known as the core set uh, definition. And what it actually does is uh, you, uh, you only count uh, a transition if you really enter uh, a new state. Now, this means that if you uh, are now cutting off all the parts that are in the uh, in state A and state B, you end up with all these little loops. And of course, there are many more loops close to A than there are uh, crossing uh, points. And so what you now can do is uh, you can uh, calculate this, this flux uh, that you really are interested in, these pathways going from A to B. Uh, you can calculate this by uh, introduce a set of interfaces. So now you do a, a foliation of the phase space. And so we have these curved interfaces here, and each of these uh, interfaces is um, parameterized by a parameter called lambda, and this goes from zero to, to n. And now I can, on a particular interface, like this green one, I can define uh, pathways. So this is my pathway going uh, through the interface and either go then uh, to the final state or to the next interface, or it goes back. And by uh, uh, sampling now pathways on this interface, uh, you can see them now, this one is being rejected, uh, under the condition that they have to cross this interface, uh, I can actually construct uh, the rate. So how do I do that? Uh, I compute the so-called crossing probability. This is this, uh, this definition. It is the probability that a path that crosses uh, lambda i for the first time after leaving a reaches also the next interface. This is this purple one. That's the definition of this particular thing. And then it's exact. Uh, this is an exact ex expression. The rate is the flux through the first interface at times. Uh, okay, this is the flux through the last interface, provided you're going through the first interface. So this is almost like a definition. But what you can uh, then do is you can do a staging algorithm. So you replace this uh, crossing probability by a series of crossing probabilities, a product where each of this product is actually not so low anymore. It is on the order of one to uh, point 0.1, yeah, between point 0.1 and 1. And this is actually very doable to calculate. So you can compute this in each of these ensembles and, uh, and you get a uh, very good, uh, I mean, an exact expression and you get very good estimates where you can uh, uh, identify um, and, and uh, quantify the uh, error in a, in a proper way. So this is a, 
uh, a, a, akin to umbrella sampling or uh, constraint uh, MD uh, sampling, but it is actually uh, uh, based on part and it is a um, uh, completely taking into account the history. Uh, so there's no Markovianity assumption and there's uh, uh, yeah, no approximation in this. Uh, um, okay, so this is showing a, a small application of that work. Here's a, a DNA uh, base pair rotation. This is from, uh, from work that we did a couple of years ago where we looked at the uh, Watson Crick base pair to the Hoxing base pair. And if you do this in a, a conjugate peak refinement, this is work by uh, Nikolova and Alan, you see uh, a, a transition like this. So this is a minimum energy pathway. Uh, but if we do uh, transition path sampling, it actually shows you that this is actually happening in a completely different way. The, uh, it, it wiggles much more, it goes uh, to the outside and then it actually uh, enters again. So there is a, um, a couple of uh, mechanism that we can actually under, uh, undergo. There's this inside mechanism, but there's also this mechanism where the, the, the base pair goes outside in the solvent and rotates and goes back in. And we can actually calculate the, the, the rate constant of this process by calculating these, uh, these crossing probabilities. And we point, put them all here now on one curve. And this is a master curve, it looks a little bit wiggly. But in the end, uh, we actually get a, uh, an estimate for this crossing probability. And this uh, uh, compares this probability with the experiments. There is a, a mismatch, um, and this was in this work. Um, uh, um, in this work, this was um, identified as a, a force field. Uh, um, well, I mean, probably a lack of the force field, but still uh, we actually see that there is a very good thermodynamic um, estimate of the, uh, of the thermodynamics is reproduced very well, but the rate is a little bit off and uh, this is uh, unclear yet if there, there is a force field or some missing uh, transition here. Um, I also, I mean, we can actually extend this. They can extend this to, uh, uh, to multiple states. Um, so, um, um, yeah, I'm, so uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, if you have multiple states, uh, then uh, this is very difficult to uh, to sample one by one, or at least you, you don't want to sample it uh, one by one in, individually. But what you can do is uh, you can do uh, multiple state versions of, of TPS and where you uh, uh, start from a uh, state A and you calculate pathways that end up in, uh, in other states. And we can do a, a similar game here. We can calculate the crossing probabilities and then uh, uh, compute uh, all the uh, the different fluxes and the different transition uh, uh, the, the, the crossing probabilities for the final um, interface, and we can actually uh, combine this using uh, TIS and uh, and multiple state uh, TIS, and the multiple state version is just allowing uh, uh, all these different pathways in one uh, simulation. And these rates can then be used in, in a Markov uh, state model. And then uh, you can actually identify exactly in the, in the normal way um, how the, uh, the transition uh, takes place. I'm, uh, I noticed, uh, Angelo, I noticed that I'm completely out of time. Am I right or not? OK, something was. Awry. Um. Sorry, yeah, uh, Perry, you, you have, well, we have till 11.30, but we thought maybe it I'm might just, be. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'm going to show you a few more, uh, a few more things because I'm, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little bit, 
anxious here. I wanted to show you that we can do this for uh, for a very for, for the folding of a protein, and this is uh, the famous uh, trip gauge. Actually, it's a small protein uh, which actually folds on uh, on a microsecond time scale. It is a two-state folder with some uh, experimental rate constant of four uh, microseconds. Uh, and it actually um, shows a couple of time scales. So this actually uh, indicates that there are intermediate states. But what we can do is actually, we can apply our uh, uh, MSTIS method uh, for this. So we get a huge rate, uh, rate matrix uh, between all these different metastable states. And then uh, we identify which uh, um, uh, uh, process is the most uh, slow process. Uh, in, and that uh, turns out uh, to be the uh, overall uh, folding to unfolding transition from U to N or from N to U, and depending on how you look at it. But there is also a, a fast process which has to do with an intermediate state, uh, which I will call here uh, SN here. We can uh, actually uh, identify a complete flux network here. So for starting from, in this case, the folded state to the unfolded state, uh, we can identify which pathways uh, um, take the, the most flux through the through the network, and then we can also identify what is the fast and the small time scale, and they actually coincide with the experimental uh, work. And this actually also allows us to uh, to identify a a metastable state which was previously uh, unknown. And so this is actually showing how you can actually do this uh, in using uh, advanced methods uh, in the um, uh, in the path sampling uh, framework. So this is actually uh, the, uh, one of the last slides. Uh, uh, this is showing the evolution of uh, path sampling algorithms. So we can uh, do intermediates by using this multi-state uh, TIS uh, approaches. Um, we can uh, improve the convergence by, uh, by RETIS, which is the replica exchange version of TIS. Uh, if you have a large amount of replicas, you can do single replica TIS, which actually is a single replica version of uh, the, the replica exchange. And most recently, we looked at uh, uh, the virtual interface exchange, uh, which allows us to get a complete path ensemble uh, from a single uh, path uh, sampling simulation. So all this is actually using uh, advanced reweighting schemes uh, that allow uh, reconstruction of unbiased dynamical trajectories ensemble. And if you do that, uh, you can actually uh, see, uh, you can reconstruct uh, also free energy calculations or free energy landscapes. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, stop. So I'm apologizing for a rather chaotic um, way of presenting, but this is also because I haven't uh, it's extremely difficult to uh, find this. <laughs> find this really difficult. Okay, uh, for the, I, the last thing I want to show you is, a, uh, is an example of um, something that we did uh, more recently together with the, uh, 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 the groups of uh, Gerrit Hammer in, uh, in, uh, in Frankfurt. And this is learning uh, sampling and, um, and uh, reaction coordinate analysis uh, together. And so I've been talking about doing transition path sampling uh, and then uh, trying to get information out of it. Um, but you can also um, uh, learn on the fly how to improve uh, your sampling by adapting where you put your uh, transition uh, by your shooting points. Uh, so this is uh, using um, reinforcement learning. So you learn where the committer is using a neural network. You collect your, uh, your pathways in this way by getting more and more better and better estimates for the transition state. And then if you have this entire committer surface, uh, you can identify uh, a, a working model for it using symbolic regression. This also makes the uh, mechanism interpretable. And we did that for uh, methane clathrate uh, formation or methane hydrate formation, where you you can actually see a crystallization uh, process. Uh, so this is not a biomolecular system, but it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. We can learn and uh, sample the PB and it actually uh, is validated quite well. We can also find out what the important uh, coordinates are. 
and then you can actually construct using uh, the um, symbolic regression a model for this particular uh, uh, process uh, which actually includes then uh, uh, the number of the, the size of the nucleus the temperature and uh, a, a surface property in the, in the sense of the number of waters and this shows you that now what the state of the art is it actually combines uh, uh, sampling analysis uh, and uh, creating insights in one framework and I think I should stop here and I would uh, like to end with a, um, uh, the conclusions uh, so we can actually uh, sample with TPS uh, an unbiased ensemble of reactive uh, trajectories um, we can do committer based analysis that yields the reaction coordinates we can do TIS to create uh, and calculate kinetic rate constants uh, we have multiple versions of this, multiple state versions uh, to allow sampling uh, a full reaction network. We can do reweighting of the path ensemble to uh, uh, do evaluation of the full reaction coordinate. And then we actually, in the last slide, I showed you how you can simultaneously sample and, uh, and analyze using machine learning. And um, well, except for the last part, the machine learning business is not in open path sampling, but it's a framework that builds on open path sampling. And you can actually uh, go to the website if you're more uh, interested. And this is the acknowledgements. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, um, the OPS team, which is on, on top here, uh, David Swenson, Jan Hendrik, John uh, and uh, Frank Noah are involved. From the UVA, uh, I want to thank um, uh, Faden for its work on the uh, proteins, uh, Arjun for crystallization work, Jocelyn for the DNA, and Bernd for his uh, uh, AI input, and then my collaborators, uh, uh, Titus, uh, Christoph, Gerhard, and uh, Roberto. So I want to uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention, and I'll uh, take some questions now. Thank okay. you very much, Peter, for also virtual uh, club for the very nice talk. Uh, so maybe we have time for a couple, I would say, more questions. I was wondering about the, yes. that last application. So could you take a reaction of which you don't know the, the mechanism nor the steps and nor, nor the how many steps it has. And can you apply that? And then finally, using that symbolic regression, figure out the how many steps the reaction has, uh, you know, the, I mean, that symbolic regression, does it, does it give you the, you know, the equation for the, for the reaction? Um. Yes, I mean, uh, I mean, the whole idea is indeed uh, that if you have an unknown process to find out what the actual reaction coordinate and the collective variables are. Um, and then based on that analysis, you also want to know the, the uh, yeah, the, 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 the an equation that combines these reaction coordinates or these combines these collective variables into a single expression. And I mean, I mean a simple, a simple I mean, a simple example is of course a linear expression. And in fact, in all the applications that we have seen until so far, people assume linear linearity. It's always assumed. But it's not clear that uh, that a linear um, uh, a, a linear form actually works. In fact, I mean, in many cases, it doesn't work. Uh, so, I mean, I can show you a. Oh wait a minute! I'm, this is wrong. Um, let me just uh, quickly show you another. Do you see this or not? Is that visible? Am I not? No. Um, where's the share button now? Okay. Okay. So yes. Now we now you can see it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sorry about this. Um, 
Okay, so uh, this actually shows you, and uh, look at the lower part here. So here's a, a, a famous um, uh, difficult uh, potential. Uh, this is called uh, the Zorro potential or the uh, Z potential, if you want to, to know. So if you start here, uh, you first have to move into the X direction and then go back. And this is very difficult to learn uh, with a linear, um, a linear reaction coordinate. And so uh, one way of doing it is uh, to come up with a uh, yeah, committer representation that can actually do this. And so, uh, yeah, here you can clearly see that nonlinear uh, reaction coordinates are, are important. But if you actually do this with the re uh, symbolic regression, uh, you can, uh, by uh, combining all these different functions, you can also end up with nonlinear functions like exponential functions or log functions or um, uh, fractional forms or uh, these are much more complicated uh, so and they allow for these nonlinear uh, behavior so yeah the answer to your question is yes you can actually start understanding how these collective variables uh, together uh, build up a, um, uh, a reaction path I hope I will. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, maybe uh, time to, we can uh, we can stop here, and because then we have to we have a small break of fifteen minutes, and we start with the other talk from the uh, from uh, from, uh, from from the, the students at CSI and the ICTP. So uh, I would like to thank uh, Peter again for uh, this very nice uh, presentation.